Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Um, today we are going to uh, do some pretty heavy studying on some passages that are uh, controversial on a woman's role in the church. Um, are you ready for that? Yes. All right, good. I'm glad you're ready for that. Um, I want to start with this. Uh, you know, I have, if you're new here, I'm Matt Van Cleve. I'm the teaching pastor. We usually have someone come out and do a welcome and announcements, but like I have so much to cover. Uh, we're, we're cutting time, but if you need prayer, uh, uh, someone will be over here to pray for you, uh, or you can write down prayer requests on the Next Step card and uh, t turn that in in the back, Next Step card, connection card, whatever it's called. Um, we'd love to pray for you. We have a team that uh, will commit to praying for you every day this week. All right, I want to start with this. The, to reach a biblical position on any subject, we must make a decision based on uh, the preponderance of evidence in Scripture. That is the whole of Scripture, not just one or two isolated passages. Uh, we have to look for the preponderance of evidence on complex issues. Uh, let me just give you an example. In 1 Peter 2.18, Peter writes this, Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but, to also, the, but also to those who are harsh. Now, there are a couple other verses similar to this. Ephesians 6.5 is one. Colossians 3.22 is another one. And in the debates about slavery in the South over 150 years ago, Southern Christians would point to 1 Peter 2.18 and say it's right there in the Bible. Slaves, obey your masters. The Bible is pro-slavery. And that was a real problem because the Bible never ever says anywhere, the writers of scripture never say anywhere, slavery is a bad institution, so get rid of it. That would have made the discussion a whole lot easier. There were a lot of people who understood the Bible to be on the side of slavery. But on the other hand, the great moral force behind abolition is overwhelmingly Christian. Uh, Christians like William Wilberforce in England and Jonathan Blanchard in Chicago who devoted their lives to the cause of freedom because of their Christian faith. They believe that when you look at the whole of scripture, it leads to the conclusion that all human beings should be free. And they would appeal to the preponderance of evidence in scripture. I mean, think about, think about it like a giant scale. On the one side of the scale, you could put verses like 1 Peter 2.18 that appear to be pro-slavery. But then they would say, on the other side of the scale, there is like so much of scripture. Go back to Genesis 1 that says all human beings are created in the image of God. We all carry that dignity. Then look at the prophets, Isaiah and Amos and others who burn with God's hatred toward oppression and injustice. Look at the book of Acts where you see this radical equality in the new church. Look at the book of Philemon where Paul writes to Philemon, receive Onesimus back, not as a slave, but as a dear brother. Look at Galatians 3.28 where Paul writes, there is now neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Christians who fought for freedom said, if you look at the preponderance of evidence in scripture, if you take into account the whole text, then clearly slavery is not consistent with God's will for human beings. And of course, looking back now, we would all say that, of course, that's right. No one would argue that the Bible is, supports a system of slavery. Now, this brings us to the issue of a woman's role in the church because there's no place in the Bible where it says, for example, patriarchy is a bad institution, so get rid of it. I mean, this is a complex discussion and well-meaning, real bright Christians disagree on it. But here's one of the unique things about this discussion. Every church has to decide what its practice will be. Every church has to decide, will we place restrictions on women exercising their and there are a lot of other theological issues where Christians disagree, things like the end times and so on, that the church doesn't have to take a formal position on. And generally, you ought to know, as a church, we strive uh, very much to not do that. Like, if there's an issue where well-meaning Christians disagree, we generally don't take a formal stance on it one way or another. 
unless it involves a practice where we actually have to take a stance. And this is one of those areas where every church has to decide what their practice will be. And we need to give rationale for that to the church. Well, here's what we believe as a church. We believe that when you take into account the whole of scripture, the clear preponderance of evidence is that God's plan for the human race is that it be a community of men and women where they share equally in the giftings of the Holy Spirit, in the image of God, and the mission of the church. Now, those who are opposed to this idea generally appeal to three passages, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 14, and 1 Timothy 2. But what I wanna suggest here is that you need to look at the preponderance of evidence in scripture. Look at God's intent in creation when he made human beings in his own image, male and female, and gave them co-dominion, co-regency over creation. Look at the loss of oneness that came as a result of the fall and the beginning of that inequality. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. That's a result of the fall. Uh, look at the leadership roles like women, uh, women like Deborah and Miriam in the Old Testament. Uh, look at the radical new attitude toward women that Jesus displayed. Look at the role of women in the New Testament church. Look at the passages about spiritual gifts where there is no mention about the, this, the, this distinction between men and women. Look at the verse, a verse like Galatians 3.28. And I believe that the preponderance of evidence in scripture is for full participation of men and women in ministry. Now here's the particular point that I wanna make here. This is important because uh, people sometimes speak as if the position that honors biblical authority is to say, we will remain hierarchical, we will restrict a woman's practice of their gifts unless you can remove every reservation from every passage. Unless every reservation is moved, well, removed, we're gonna remain hierarchical. And I just wanna point out that on any given complex issue, that's not the correct hermeneutic. It dishonors the notion of the authority of the whole of scripture. The right interpretive approach is to say, I will go with the preponderance of evidence in scripture on a complex issue. Now today, I wanna start by looking at roles that women played in the New Testament, and then we'll go specifically to these difficult passages, two of which are in 1 Corinthians, while we're talking about this today. I wanna start with Acts 1.14. After Jesus ascended, while the believers were waiting for Pentecost, we're told that the disciples of Jesus would meet in an upper room. Verse 14, they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and with the brothers. So Luke, the writer of Acts, wants us to know that women, as well as men, are part of this community that are waiting for the church to be born. And then it's born, and the Holy Spirit is poured out at Pentecost, and Peter gets up and makes one of the most important speeches in the history of the church. And it's fascinating what Old Testament reference he cites to interpret what's going on when the Holy Spirit descends on them. Look at Acts 2, 16 and 17. Peter's explaining about what's going on at Pentecost. And he says this, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Uh, I think it's striking that um, out of all the texts in the Old Testament, that Peter could reference, he mentions, his, he mentions the promise that God would pour out his spirit on all people, male and female. And there would come a spirit-inspired prophetic ministry that would include both men and women with, without regard to gender. That would be the signature of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And that could only happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. No other power could break through barriers like that. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. Uh, that evidence of the Spirit is reflected in the lives of women in the early church. Acts 21.9 tells us about four women, four daughters of Philip who prophesied. They had the ministry of prophecy. Prophecy. 
I want to say a word or two about what prophecy involves. Prophecy is a word that means to speak authoritatively the word of God. Now, I want to take a moment to describe this because some people take this position. They'll say women can prophesy, but they can't, uh, that doesn't involve authoritative teaching. That prophecy is like a lesser function. But that's not clear in what the writers of scripture say about prophecy. In 1 Corinthians 14.3, Paul is writing about the ministry of prophecy, but everyone who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Those who speak in a tongue edify to themselves, but those who prophesy edify the church. So in other words, prophecy is to edify, to build up the church. Look at verse six. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will it be to you unless I bring to you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Now, with those four terms, revelation, knowledge, prophecy, and word of instruction, Paul is not making any kind of sharp distinctions. There are some nuances attached to each one of these words, but they're largely overlapping terms that have to do with building up the church. Now, look at verse 31. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. You can prophesy though so that all will be taught or all will learn or all will be encouraged. In other words, the result of prophecy is learning and instruction. There's a teaching function to it. And women are doing this as well as men in the church. Another remarkable passage, Romans 16. In Romans 16, Paul is writing to honor many people in the church. In this passage, if you want, just read through the passage, uh, this passage in Romans 16 sometime. Many of them are women. He honors them using quite extraordinary language. And I'm just gonna read a couple of them. Romans 16, one. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant, or it could be translated deacon, um, either way. Um, a servant of the church in Centuria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she may need from you for she has been a great help to many people, including to me. Now, these are remarkable words about a woman in those days. And this was the standard introduction for someone bearing a letter. I commend to you this person. I ask you to receive this person in a way worthy of the saints. This was a standard introduction for someone bearing a letter, so that most likely meant that Phoebe was the one carrying this letter to the Roman church. And the custom of that day was that whoever was carrying the letter would be called on to explain anything in that letter that the people had questions about. Now, if you've ever studied the book of Romans, imagine being the one to, to answer the question, well, what did Paul mean about that in the book of Romans? Paul underscores her authority and her competence. It's a woman that's gonna have the role to explain the letter of Romans to the church. Look at verse seven at another remarkable woman. I remember when I first learned about this verse, how surprising it was to me. Greet Andronicus and Junia. My relatives who have been in prison with me, they are astounding among the apostles. Now, Andronicus is a, ma a male name. Junia is a female name. This is a woman who is counted as an apostle. They are outstanding among the apostles. And if you want to read more about this, I highly recommend a great book. It's called Junia is Not Alone. It's written by Scott McKnight. Um, but you see, this means a woman had the title apostle. That was the highest title that you could have. Interestingly enough, um, this has bothered some translators uh, so much that a few translators have changed the spelling of Junia to Junius, which would make it a male's name, a masculine ending. But in all the best ancient manuscripts, it's a woman's name. So we see scattered throughout the New Testament these glimpses of women where extraordinary things are happening in the church, which is very different from what is happening in the culture at that time. All right, what I wanna do now is turn to these three passages that pose the greatest difficulty around allowing women full participation in the life of the church and the work of the church. And I just wanna be real direct, uh, direct with them. The first one is 1 Corinthians 11, and it's starting at verse two. And I need to read through this whole passage um, just so we get the full picture of it. And this is what Paul writes. Paul writes, 
I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved. Then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Everything clear so far? (laughs) We're going to come back to this. All right, let's keep reading. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is uh, not independent of man, nor man independent of woman. For as a woman came from man, also a man was born of a woman, but everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Okay, now very clearly, much of what Paul writes here relates to a cultural situation that we really don't know all about. Like, we've discovered a lot through history and through archaeology, um, but we don't know all about what Paul is referencing here but I want to make several key observations about this passage. The first and most clear one is that Paul is expressively like affirming public ministry of women. Paul is saying that women must pray and prophesy. Remember, that means delivering a message to the congregation in a public setting. In our day, some people argue that, well, they should only do that for women. Or women, you know, they should only do that for, uh, for, for children or something like that, not mixed groups. But clearly, from the context where Paul talks about needing to wear head coverings and so on, he's talking about a congregation of men and women in it. This is the most striking single teaching in this text. It's a whole new direction. It's a radical departure from the past. You know, it used to be that when there was a Jewish uh, community in a city, If they wanted to form a synagogue, there had to be 10 men in it. Women didn't even count toward the synagogue. So there could be like 90 women. And if there were not 10 men, they could not be a legitimate synagogue. This is a striking departure now. Paul is expressly affirming the public ministry, prophecy, and prayer, delivering God's message to the congregation of women. The second observation is that there's a huge debate about the meaning of the term head. And I'll just say a word or two about this. The Greek word is the word kephale. Um, It's a word that meant head, literally the head of a body. Now, archon is a common word that Paul would use to talk about authority. He does not use the word archon. He uses the word kephale. So what does Paul mean by the word kephale or head? In our language, in English, Uh, We mostly uh, think of the word metaphorically to mean boss or the one in charge. In ancient Greek, kephale was not used that way. Kephale was most often used to describe the head, literally the head of a person, or the source, like the head or source of um, like a river or something like that. And if that's the case, then what Paul is saying here is that Christ is the, that Christ in his incarnation came from the Father, and that Adam was created by Christ, and that woman came from the body of man. Now, there's huge debates about this. Enormously long papers are written by people that are far smarter than I am on this. But ultimately, my own opinion on this is not a whole lot hinges hinges on this debate. And here's why. 
Again, like in Ephesians 6, 5, Paul says, slaves, obey your masters as unto the Lord. I believe that our best understanding is not endorsing the system of slaves and masters as a permanent system. He's simply acknowledging the way things are in that day. And I think it's entirely possible that Paul could be acknowledging the, the cultural truth that they live in a society where husbands are over their wives just as masters are over their slaves without saying in either case that the societal system is not the best expression of God's will. And if you wanna study more on this, I highly recommend, there's a commentary on 1 Corinthians written by Leon Morris. Uh, I, highly, I highly recommend you read it. Okay, we gotta move on. In verse seven, it says that Woman is the glory or reflection of man. Now, does that mean that she is lower than him? Not necessarily. The exact same expression is used in the Old Testament to say Saul is the glory of Israel. Uh, it's a phrase. Now, likewise, in verse 8 and 9, where he talks about woman being made for the sake of man, it does not imply lower status or function. I think it's similar uh, to the term helper. In Genesis, a woman was made for the sake of man so that the two together could experience community, which man could not experience on his own before God created Eve. And by the way, that same term helper is used of God in the Old Testament. In verses 11 and 12, Paul gets to his ultimate point. Take a look at it again, verse 11. Nevertheless, in the Lord, so in the church that's being formed, Woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For a woman came from man, also a man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. Paul's ultimate point here is the interdependence of men and women expressed now in public ministry for both. Another observation about this passage has to do with the significance of the head coverings. So what is that about? Well, the short answer is they faced, I think, a cultural situation that just does not exist in our day. The patron saint of Corinth was Aphrodite, so the goddess of love. Temple prostitution was part of the history of the church, of the city. And it had a, like an uncovered head, most likely, was one of the ways that prostitutes identified themselves. And so most likely, these instructions about head coverings come from Paul's desire that Christian worship be very sharply distinguished from this kind of sexual promiscuity that associated pagan worship in Corinth. He wanted to make sure that everyone was real clear about the difference. It doesn't mean that women should always wear head coverings. That was something related to a particular culture. Paul was talking about head coverings because he wanted them to be a reminder that women have dignity and they should be treated with respect. And he wanted for everyone to be real clear that Christian women are not to be like the wild women in pagan worship, that their contributions are not to be slighted, that head coverings were to be a reminder of their authority, their new authority now in the Lord to prophesy and to pray. Take a look at verse 10. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Now this, this verse is a bit obscure, like what do angels have to do with this? Now there are a lot of theories about this that I just don't have time to get into. And just a side note here, uh, just a word to the wise in general, and this has to do with the prom problem of translations. Because translators, especially people who are, uh, para do uh, paraphrases, a paraphrase is a version of the Bible where it didn't come from the original language. So a paraphrase would be someone who takes an English version of the Bible and then they write their version from that English uh, language Bible. Translators, and especially paraphrasers, often kind of make their own interpretation and it, get, it gets influenced by their own point of view. And I'll just give you a classic example of this. Here's the literal rendering of 1 Corinthians 11:10. So this is word for word from the Greek text. Because of this, a woman ought to have authority upon the head because of the angels. Now again, the angels part is somewhat obscure, but the quite clear meaning is that the head covering is to be somehow a sign of 
a woman's authority to engage now in public ministry. Now, I want you to take a look at a paraphrase called the living letters. So a woman should wear a head covering on her head as a sign that she is under a man's authority, a fact for all the angels to notice and rejoice in. You see how far away that is from the literal meaning of the text. And of course, the danger of this is that people read that paraphrase and they think, well, that's what Paul meant. That's not what Paul meant. Now, that's not to make a negative comment on any particular paraphrase or translation because I think most translators and paraphrasers are very sincerely motivated, and I know a lot of them are a lot smarter than I am, but it is to say that you really need to be careful. And in studying a complex issue like this one, it's good to read a number of translations to try to get to the clearest meaning of especially disputed text like this one. All right, the first text, 1 Corinthians 11. Now let's look at the second text, 1 Corinthians 14. 34 and 35. This is what Paul writes. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. The obvious problem that this raises is how do you reconcile this text with the text in 1 Corinthians 11? just a couple paragraphs earlier where he says women should prophesy and pray aloud in the church. Now, there are a couple different positions on this. Some people say, well, you don't reconcile them. They just contradict each other. But part of our belief as a church is we believe in the authority of Scripture. Therefore, we believe that Paul was not contradicted. There is a solution that, that, that has to make sense to us. That this, this idea of contradicting each other is not acceptable to us. Another group of people would say that in the early passage... 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul talks about women having a public ministry. He wasn't referring to being in the church, kind of like, we hear, like we're here on Sunday morning, but being in a small group or something like that. And the difficulty with that is that in the early church, being gathered together was the church. They didn't have auditoriums or, building or buildings or anything like this. All churches were house churches. So... What he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 11 is the church that's gathered together. It's a group of people that are gathered. They're the church. Now, my own belief is, and it's certainly not original with me, I think Paul here is addressing a particular situation. You see, women today are able to learn. Women are highly educated. Uh, Kylie McCormick, she used to be on our staff. She had a PhD. She was the most educated person on our staff. She was a woman. And so uh, women are educated in the first, we're not educated in the first century, they are in our century. So what, what, what probably was going on is there was disorderly worship and learning in the Corinthian church. That actually, that's the context of the entire chapter 14. The, so it makes, it fits into the context of what Paul is talking about in the entire chapter. What is most likely going on is that learning was happening but women were asking questions that were disrupting the learning experience for everyone else. They didn't know the background or the context of the things that were being taught, and so they're turning and they're asking questions like right in the middle of the teaching. Now, imagine how disruptive it would be if you were listening to this message and like half of the people in this room are turning to someone else saying, well, what does he mean by that? I mean, it would be a whole lot harder to follow this message than it already is, right? It's kind of a disorder thing going on. Like it would just be impossible to learn. And so I think Paul is saying they need to stop disrupting and ask questions at home. That's why he writes what he does in verse 35. The second problem is what does Paul mean when he says they must be silent as the law says? Because nowhere in the Old Testament is there a law or a writing that says women must be silent. Most likely, Paul is referring to the general Old Testament teaching that worshipers and learners should be silent and submissive before God. And that's the appropriate posture of learning. Okay, so most likely this passage is referring to what happens in a new day when learning is taking place for women, 
but it's being disruptive. All right, so third passage, 1 Timothy 2.9. This is what Paul writes. I also want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But woman will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, Paul gives a number of commands in this passage, and the question is, how do you apply them? How do we apply them? Uh, Take a look at verse nine. I also want women to dress modestly with decency or propriety, not with braided hair, gold, or pearls, or expensive clothes. Now, I would just say, just take a look around this room. Any braided hair? Any gold jewelry? Any expensive clothes? Paul says, no braided hair, no gold jewelry, no pearls, no expensive clothes. More than a day's wage in those days would have been maybe the equivalent of $30 or $40 in our day. So just to put it into context, expensive clothes would be in that day a pair of jeans that are more than a day's wage. So more than $40. And I want to ask a show of hands on this one, but how many of you are in violation of that? (laughs) Like why? Like why are you disobeying this command? Well, there's another real key hermeneutical point here, and that is we must distinguish between universal principles, that which apply at all times and all places, and local principles that have to do with a particular situation in that culture. We must distinguish between that which is universal and that which is restrictive. So just to make sure that you all have this category straight, I'll just give you a test. I'm going to run through a few different commands in Scripture, and I'll ask you to say out loud, so this is participate, audience participation, is this command universal or restrictive? Okay, so here we go. Love your neighbor as yourself, universal or restrictive? Universal. 1 Corinthians 7.1, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Are you really that unsure? Like, I'm amazed we have any kids in our kids' ministry right now. <laughs> Micah 6, 8, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Universal or restrictive? Universal. First Timothy 5, 23, take a little wine for your stomach. Are you just being stubborn now? <clears throat> Restrictive would be the answer uh, that we're looking for there. Okay, so there's universal principles and then local applications. And here's the deal. It's not always easy to tell which is which. And real smart people pray and they work real hard to distinguish between the two. And so I want to make, uh, um, I don't want to make it sound easy. It's not, it's not easy. Um, and that's why very sincere Christians disagree a lot of times on issues like this one. But my point here is we have to apply cultural sensitivity to verses 9 through 15. You can't just blindly pick and choose and say, well, that verse doesn't apply to today, but this verse does apply to today for no particular reason. And again, when people do that, I mean, we can find verses in Scripture to support all kinds of crazy ideas. So let's walk through this. The first striking feature that I want to point out in verse 11 is that Paul literally says, let a woman learn. Like, learn is a verb, and the form of this verb is the imperative. Uh, There were different Greek moods for verbs. The indicative was simply a statement of fact. The imperative is actually a command. It says something must happen. Make it be so. That's the form that Paul uses here to learn. Paul doesn't just say women can be allowed to learn. Paul is stating a command. Women must learn. Now, this is a revolutionary thing in that day. That is that this would be in the imperative form. Remember, this is, again, the backdrop in which women were virtually uneducated. There was a rabbinic saying in the ancient times that read, it's better... To, it's better for the book of the law, for the book of Torah, to be burned than to be taught to a woman. Those are rabbinic saying. 
And here, Paul is commanding that women should learn. Women should be taught. And so you see the thought of a woman teaching in that day would almost be non-existent because the vast majority of cases, women were just not allowed to become educated. And Paul is saying this has to stop. This has to stop in the church. And then he goes on to describe how women should learn in quietness and submission. And the question here is to whom? Quietness and submission to whom? One answer is husband. That's one theory, submission to their husbands. But Paul doesn't say that. And what about unmarried women? I think probably Paul is saying here that women should have an appropriate attitude of a learner to the one who is teaching and to the subject matter. She ought to be submissive to the one who is teaching and to the subject matter. Now in verse 12, Paul says, I permit no woman to teach or have authority over a man. Now a couple observations here. First of all, Paul does not use the imperative here. He doesn't say, don't permit a woman to teach. Not like he uses the command to say, allow a woman to learn. He says, I do not permit, and it's in the present tense. It's possible, now it's certainly not certain, but it's possible that it could be translated, I am not currently permitting. It's one of the ways that that present tense is used to talk about in the current condition. And in this case, Paul's point would be that women must learn before they can teach. And they haven't learned yet. So of course, they can't teach yet. And Paul goes on to say, or have authority over a man. And he uses two verbs in parallelism, so they're set side by side, so they like reflect on each other. Now, he doesn't use the usual word for authority in the, in the New Testament. He uses a Greek word, authentain, which is used only one time in the New Testament. It's only used in this, uh, this, this uh, verse, one time. And this is another word where there's a lot of debate, but it seems to carry this idea of uh, to dominate or to control. Now, some argue that it doesn't carry that meaning. Some argue that it does. But if it does, then most likely Paul is not permitting, uh, permanently forbidding women teachers. Rather, he's warning that women in Ephesus are trying to use their newfound status as learners to try to usurp Uh, the teacher's place, trying to correct and so on, before they actually understand what it is that the teacher's trying to teach. Authentane probably helps to show what Paul warns against, not just teaching, but to teach that seeks to dominate or control. Now, in verses 13 and 14, Paul appeals to the creation account, and this is important because some people say, well, since he appeals to Adam and Eve, It's not just a cultural issue, the command is universal because it connects it to creation, connects it to Adam and Eve. But Paul's not saying here that women are more to blame than men, uh, so that all women must be limited in function. For instance, in Romans five, Paul says that sin entered the world not through a woman, but through a man. And so he talks about the creation in fairly flexible ways. I think he's, he's using what happened in Eden here as an example of what he's trying to guard against, not as a proof text of why women should never teach. He's saying that the woman in the garden had not received firsthand teaching about the prohibition of the tree from God, but Adam had. So Adam had firsthand teaching, therefore uh, she was more vulnerable because she hadn't received that. Likewise, there were women in Ephesus who had not yet learned about the faith, they didn't receive direct teaching. Therefore, they were not ready to become teachers yet. I'm not currently permitting. There is a universal principle here, and that is no one should aspire to teach if they have not yet learned. All right, finally in this text, verse 15, this is again a fairly obscure verse, but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, what does he mean by this? And there are several different theories. No one is sure about it. It could be that the childbearing reference is uh, a reference to Mary's childbearing, the birth of Christ. Uh, Some would say that he's saying here that women ought to fulfill a domestic role. But of course, the difficulty would be uh, that interpretation about like, what about single women? What about women who don't bear children? 
And doesn't that become kind of a works righteousness? You earn your way into salvation somehow by burying children. It could be that what he's saying here, or another way this could be translated is, women will be brought safely through childbearing. It could be that this is part of the curse being overturned. That's a, uh, there's another theory about that. Now, one last comment on this, uh, this, this passage. The alternative explanation, if you want to say that Paul is limiting women here in this passage universally, then you're left with saying that Paul is saying that because Eve was deceived, women are to be subordinate. And this would be odd because Paul's clear teaching in the New Testament is that all of humanity, male and female, have equally participated in the fall and therefore equally can be fully redeemed. Now, I'd like to look at one final passage. It's Galatians uh, 3.28. And this is quite a remarkable statement that Paul makes. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, you gotta make the connection between this verse and a prayer that was prayed in Paul's day. It's found in several different sources in the ancient world that every morning, Jewish males would wake up and pray Blessed art thou, O God, for you did not make me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. That was a common prayer. It would get prayed every day. Paul himself probably prayed that prayer himself. So it's no accident that Galatians 3.28 is worded the way that it is. It's set against this backdrop in this culture. Why would Jewish males pray that prayer? So a scholar named F.F. F. Bruce, he points this out. It wasn't to discourage those groups. It wasn't meant to be unkind. Jewish males would say that because if they weren't Jewish males, free, they could not participate fully in the community of faith. Around the temple, there would be a court of Gentiles. If you were a Gentile, you couldn't go past that. There was a court of women. If you were a woman, you couldn't go past that. Now, some people say this verse relates only to salvation. Paul is only saying that each one of these groups can be saved. But even in the Old Testament, everyone knew that all of those groups could be saved. That wasn't a new idea. What was a new idea was that God was creating a new church and where, where all could participate freely. And that old prayer was no longer valid. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. And of course, there were huge debates in the early church about the distinction between Jews and Gentiles. And like, this was, this was held up in the church. Many thought that to be Jewish was uh, superior. The 12 disciples, for example, were Jewish. And it could be argued that God's way of, this was God's way of saying that the leadership of the church should be Jewish, that Jewish people should be at the top. But Paul says, no, those ethnic divides are torn down. When they came to Christ, people were still Jewish, they were still Gentile, but those distinctions are irrelevant now about participation in the life of the church. And then Paul says, neither slave nor free. And this was like hugely debated in the church for 1800 years. People would point to the scripture and say, slaves obey your masters. But Paul is saying, no, in Christ, these old class distinctions are irrelevant to participation in the church. And then he has this staggering third pair, neither male nor female. When someone is in Christ, whether they're male or female is no longer the most important thing about them. They still remain male and female, but that distinction is irrelevant to their full participation in the life of the church. The old prayer isn't valid anymore. God's plan is for his people to know oneness. And I just wanna say one last thing for today, and I'm sorry this is so long. Many Christians, as you know, disagree on this issue, and it's quite con controversial. Many wonderful Christians and many wonderful churches and a lot, have a lot of different positions, and you know, I just wanna honor them. Uh, a lot of churches have a different stance than ours, and I just wanna honor them. But what I wanna say is this, I am incredibly grateful to be a part of this church. I look at our church and I think of like where all of the women and the men serve in the church and how we work together and how we have built this church. I think of Ashley Lewis, who leads our kids ministry. 
I think of Lisa Harrington, who leads our compassion ministry, or Michelle Enriquez, who leads our student ministries, or Tina Jacob, who leads our prayer ministry, or Beth Miller, who leads our new guests into the life of our church, or a number of our current or former board members who are women, and I'm so glad that I get to benefit from the leadership of these women in this church. I have three children who have all received Christ in this church, who have all been baptized in this church, and I'm so grateful that I and my family get to benefit from the gifts of many of the women who are leaders in this church. And those are just a few women that I'm close to. There are hundreds of women, so many of you in this room, so many of you who serve with all of the gifts that God has given you, and we would not be the church we are today if it were not for you. And I know there's a lot of great churches around, but I'm so grateful to be a part of this one, where there is no longer Jew nor Greek, no longer slave nor free, no longer male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. All right, let me pray for you as the band, the worship team comes to lead us in a closing song. God, I'm so grateful that you created your church, that you created male and female to serve according to our giftedness, not according to our gender. And you've gifted us to lead and to teach and to serve in so many different ways and we get to see that in our church and it's just so beautiful. God, I pray that we would see more of it that you, would, that you would help us to take greater risks in this place to advance your kingdom in this community. Thank you for all the women who serve so faithfully in this church and who have made this church what it is.